Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on cell. We are going to discuss cell as the basic unit of life. We are going to discuss on the processes and the macromolecules present in the cell. For the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Dr. Amit Bhattacharya is associate Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjus College, University of Delhi. Dear friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Amit Bhattacharya on today's topic, that is cells, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our toll-free number is 18001010430. I repeat, our number is 18001010430. You are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture as well as dear friends kindly ask questions pertaining to the topic only. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Amit Bhattacharya, once again. Hello, Thank sir. Welcome ma'am. to the Thank lecture. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear viewers. In this part of the lecture, we will be talking about what exactly cells are and how the cells are uh, have evolved over a period of time and what the functions, what the various functions the cell does. Before going into the cells, we should know what exactly cells and let us define what exactly cells are. So, we know that our body has many different kind of cells and each of them are specialized to perform certain functions and processes. Like if we see the diagrammatic representation over here, these are the nasal cells, then we can see the onion cells and we can see many of the bacterial cells which are engulfed by the various macrophages or the other white blood cells. So variously accordingly to their development and the growth processes, the cells have been diversified and differentiated and they maintain the body for a proper functioning and helps into day to day uh, maintenance and the processes of the body also. Now, let us see how exactly the cells were first discovered and what, what exactly was cell named of and why the cell came into the picture. Now, initially the initial experiments or the work was done in the year 1665. Uh, it was done by Robert Hooke. So, he was the first one who discovered and identified and named the, uh, the molecules which he could see as cells. Then subsequently liver hook uh, came into the picture in the year 1674 he observed the live cells but he could not see the greater details of the cells because of the limitations of his microscopes. Subsequently the cell theory came into the picture in which Sheldon, Schwann and Virchow played an important role and this particular cell theory came up in the year 1838 to 1839. Now, the, the discovery of the cells is generally credited to the scientist who was a microscopist in the year, uh, in the early 18th century. Now, his name was Robert Hooke. So, we can see the microscope which he used in uh, for the discovery of these cells. Now, he, uh, he was awarded a key position in the Royal Society of London and worked as a curator over there. So, Royal Society of London is the England's foremost scientific academy. Now, what he observed under the microscopes are the honeybee comb like structures which can be seen. So, this is the structure and this is the diagram which he made after observing those particular materials. Now, he wrote in the year 1665 that I took a good clear piece of cork with the help of the pen knife, I cut a piece of it off and then examined it under the microscope. And what I could see is little porous materials much like the honeycomb. So, this is what he discovered. Now, subsequently he named these particular systems or the pores as cells because he got reminded of the monks who were living in the monastery in such kind of cellular structures. Now, uh, the next one came up by the scientist, his name was Aton van Leeuwenhoek. So, he was a Dutch man, a Dutch scientist and he was the first one to examine a drop of pond water under the microscope and to his excitement he found that there were lots of tiny microscopic organisms which was floating on these pond water. Now, subsequently he was the first one to describe the various forms of the bacteria also. Now, in the year 1838, Sheldon, he was a German botanist who was 
initially a lawyer, subsequently turned into a botanist, concluded that despite the differences in the structure of the various tissues, plants were made up of cells and the plant embryo arose from a single cell. Uh, to adding to this one, in the year 1839, Schwann, another German zoologist and a colleague of Sheldon's, published a comprehensive report on the cellular basis of animal life. So, this led to the foundation of the cell theory also. Now, subsequently, another scientist, uh, Rudolf Virchow, came up with a hypothesis that cells are the basic building block units of the life and the cells are formed from the pre-existing cell. So, through the observation over a period of time from the Hoek, Leeuwenhoek, Schrenden, Schwein, Warchow and many others, it led to the development of the cell theory. So, the cell theory basically states that all the living things or the organisms are made up of cells, new cells are created by the old cells dividing into two and cells are basic building units of life also. Now, the classical interpretation of the cell theory is also uh, pointed in these five points. The first one says that all the living organisms are made up of one or more cells. So, if they are made up of one cell, they are called as the unicellular. If they are of, made up of multiple cells, then they are called as the multicellular. The second one is the cells are the basic units of life. And the third one is called as the which was given up by the Warcher. All cells arise from the pre-existing cells. And the fourth one is the cells is the unit structure physiology and organization of living things and the last one is the cells retains a dual existence as a distinct identity and a building block in the construction of the organisms. So, by the development of the cell theory, it led to the foundation and discovery of the various other things also. Now, to this cell uh, theory, there were some uh, exceptions which were also uh, classified. The first one was the viruses. So, viruses were considered by many scientists as alive, yet they were not made up of cells. So, viruses have many features of life, but by definition of the cell theory, they are not alive. So, this is one of the exception. The other exception is the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, which have their own genetic material and reproduce independently from the rest of the cells. So, these are the two major uh, exemptions from the cell theory. Now, let us come into the first cell which was identified and how exactly it came into the picture. Now, it appears or it is being thought that the first life emerged at least about 3.8 billion years ago, approximately 750 million years after earth was formed. Now, how exactly the life originated and first cell came into the picture, there were number of experiments which were done over a period of time which gave us the clue that how exactly the cells came into the picture. One of the most basic uh, experiment which was done was done by the Urey and the Miller. So, many a times it is referred as the Urey Miller experiment. Now, the Urey Miller experiment which was done in the year 1950s was basically a chemical experiment that simulated the conditions thought at the time of the present or on early earth condition and it tested the chemical origin of life under primitive condition. Now, in this particular uh, experiment, Urey and Miller constructed a specialized, uh, specialized chamber in which they try to make the chamber into a reducing kind of environment, which means that there were high levels of uh, methane, uh, there were uh, hydrogen which was there, there were uh, the water molecule, there were ammonia which was there. So, the primitive environment of the earth surface was basically a reducing kind of environment which was created in the bulb like structure. Now, subsequently what they did is they heated the water molecule which evaporated to come uh, in that bulb, uh, glass bulb. And in that particular glass bulb, with the help of the electrode, there were electric discharges which were created. So, these were all uh, uh, stimulating the primitive kind of environment or the environment which was present in the early development days of the earth. 
So subsequently the materials or the macromolecules, micromolecules which were formed, they were cooled with the help of the condensers and they were stocked in a reservoir. Now subsequently when the reservoirs were checked, it was found that there were lots of organic molecules which were present in this particular formation. Basically many of the amino acids such as the alanine, aspartic acid, glutamic, glycine, then there were some uh, amino group containing molecules like urea, then there was lactic acid, acetic acid, formic acid. So this is this led to the foundation and giving the scientists a clue how exactly from the basic water molecule, how exactly the macro and the micro molecules were formed in the reducing kind of environment. So this be, became one of the instrumental experiment in giving the scientists clue and discovering how exactly the various molecules are formed. Now, it is said that the first cell is presumed to have a, a, um, a arisen by the enclosure of a self-replicating RNA molecule in a membrane which is basically composed of phospholipids. So, phospholipids are basically an amphipathic molecule which contains two portions. One is called as the water uh, insoluble which is hydrophobic and the other one is called as the water soluble which is hydrophilic. Now, the hydrophobic molecule are basically the long chains of this one and the head groups are basically the hydrophilic. We will see into the picture how exactly the for, um, phospholipids looks like. So, this is one of the initial cells which is thought to be formed in the primitive environment which contain the RNA as the hereditary material which was covered with the help of the phospholipid bilayer. So, we can see there are head ridge groups which are basically hydrophobic, hydrophilic in nature means water loving while the tail regions are hydrophobic which are water repelling. So, two layers of these phospholipids uh, were combined to form the membrane structure or the phospholipid membrane across the RNA molecule. So, this is thought as the first cell which was created in the early primitive environment. Now, if we see the earth biological clock and we counteract how exactly the various organisms and the various kingdoms arose. So, we can see that there is a origin of earth, then the life came into the picture, then the photosynthetic bacteria came into the picture, then the cyanobacteria, then the eukaryotes, then the algal kingdom came into the picture, subsequently shelly invertebrates came into the picture, then the these all things came in the pre-Cambian period, then subsequently there was Paleozoic era, Mesozoic and Cenozoic area in which the vascular plants developed, then came the mammals and at the end developed the human being. So, this is basically showing the earth biological clock and how exactly in the earth history which is proposed time of appearance of the major groups of organisms. So, how from a simpler group of organisms subsequently over a period of time the complex groups of organisms got developed. So, the various geological eras are also shown in the center of this biological clock. Now, the two basic classes of the cells which have been differentiated, one is called as the prokaryotic, the other one is called as the eukaryotic. Now, the prokaryotic means the uh, organisms or the cells which were initially formed. Now, there are subsequently, there are lots of differences between the prokaryotes and the eukaryotic cells. So, some of the differences are in the nucleus. So, uh, the nucleus is absent in the case of the prokaryotes while it is present in the case of the eukaryotes. The diameter of basic cells of the prokaryotes are basically about 1 micrometer while the eukaryote cells are between 10 to 100 micrometer. While the cytoskeleton in the prokaryotes are absent while in the case of the eukaryotes the cytoskeleton is present. Now, the cytoplasmic organelles are absent while in the eukaryotes the cytoplasmic organelles are present. The DNA contents in the uh, eukaryotes is much higher than the prokaryotes while in the case of the prokaryote the chromosomes are basically single circular DNA molecules while in the case of the eukaryotes it is, it is uh, double helix DNA molecules which is covered up in a uh, uh, cellular organelle which is called as the nucleus. Now, 
if we see the structure over here so this is a structure of a thin section of the bacterium bacillus which is shown the tem structure and the typical rod shaped bacterium which are shown so we can see on the outer side there are pili so pili are basically the attachment structures on the surface of the some prokaryote then comes the nucleoid which is basically the region where the cells dna is located and it is not uh, enclosed by a membrane in the case of the rod shaped bacterium while next comes is the ribosomes then comes the plasma membrane then the cell wall capsules flagella so we can see all these structural details in the prokaryotic organisms now there are certain features uh, of the uh, prokaryotes and the eukaryotes which are different from each other and many of them are similar to each other so features which are held in common by both the types of the cells are plasma membrane of similar construction is present in both of them genetic information which is encoded in dna using identical genetic code then there is a process of transcription translation which takes place with the help uh, of the ribosomes is present in both of them then there are various metabolic process which are shared by both the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic such as the glycolysis krebs cycle then comes the basic energy currency of the cell which is basically the atp molecule then there are similar mechanisms of photosynthesis between cyanobacteria and the green plants then there are similar mechanisms for synthesizing and inserting membrane molecules and finally there are proteases which are present which are basically the enzymes which are responsible pro for protein digestion now there are some features which are uh, not found in the prokaryotes but they are found in the eukaryotes so some of the features are the division of these cells into nucleus and the cytoplasm while in the prokaryotes there is no uh, nucleus kind of structures which are there apart from there there are various differences which are there like the complex flagella and cilia are present there are specialized cytoplasmic organelles which are present for aerobic respiration such as the mitochondria chloroplast for photosynthesis then there are cytoskeleton systems which are present which includes the microfilaments intermediate filaments and microtubules then there are presence of two copies of genes per cell which are present which is basically diploidy one from each of the parents and there are pre presence of three different types of rna synthesizing enzymes rna polymerases and sexual reproduction requiring meiosis and fertilization is present in the eukaryote so there are lots of features which are absent in the prokaryotes now if we see the diagrammatic representation over here these both of them shows one of them shows the prokaryotic cell which is the bacteria and the other one shows the eukaryotic cells which are basically the protist fungi animal and the plants over here now the cell cultures also came into the picture by the end of the 1950s so the first cell culture to maintain the in vitro cultures of these human cells came up in the year 1951 by the two scientists george and martha gay in the laboratory of john hopkins university so they maintained a malignant tumor cell lines which was named as the hela cell lines name after the do donor henrietta lacks so it was called as the hela cell lines and this cell line was maintained in the lab in the in vitro condition for a over period of time so till now these hela cell lines are present and they are actively used as the model uh, model cell lines for the various experiments also now if we see the representation over here it shows the level of cellular and molecular organization which is basically the example which is taken over here is the microscopic structures of the villus of the wall of the small intestine so we can see the small intestine villi which is first uh, magnified into the various structure then subsequently it is magnified into the cellular representation and then from the cellular to finally to the uh, the macro molecule level which are the dna and the various structures over here now over a period of time with the development of the cells there was a evolution of the metabolisms also so initially we know that the environment was anaerobic atmosphere of the earth so the first uh, uh, energy generating reactions presumably 
have been developed from the breakdown of the organic molecules in the absence of the oxygen. So, the anaerobic atmosphere was creating a atmosphere, reducing atmosphere due to which the organic molecules got broken down and one of the first uh, reaction which might have took place was the glycolysis reaction in which the anaerobic breakdown of the glucose to lactic acid takes, uh, pyruvate takes place then subsequently the pyruvate gets converted to lactic acid with the generation of two molecules, net generation of two molecules of ATP. Now, if we see the representation over here, this shows that how exactly the glucose which is C6 carbon gets converted to lactic acid which is a C3 carbon and in the process of the conversion, there is a synthesis and generation of two molecules of ATP over here. Now, similar kind of reaction took place in the photosynthesis where six molecule of carbon dioxide with six molecule of water molecule in the presence of uh, sunlight got to form the uh, C6 molecule which is the glucose molecule. Now, over the evolution of the metabolism, the oxidative metabolism also came into the picture and this oxidative metabolism means the glucose molecule which is a C6 carbon molecule, how exactly and completely it gets metabolized to form 6 molecules of carbon dioxide and 6 molecule of water generating about 36 to 38 molecules of ATP molecule. So, we know that the ATP molecule is the one which is called as the energy currency of the cell. Now, if we see the structural hierarchy uh, in the molecular organization of the cell, so the level 1 represents the monomeric unit which is basically the nucleotides, amino acids, sugar molecule. So, these represents the level 1. Then comes the level 2 which are basically the macromolecules which are DNA molecule, protein, cellulose. And the third one is the supramolecular complexes. So, these DNA molecules further they uh, get condensed to form the chromosomes over there. Then the protein molecule along with the various phospholipids they form the plasma membrane. We just discussed about the phospholipid bilayer and the cellulose or the sugar molecules they further get uh, polymerized to form the cell wall over here. So, this is the third level of the organization and the fourth level of the organization is the cell and its organelle. So, we can see how exactly the structural hierarchy in the molecular organization of the cell is taking place over here. Now, if we see the molecular organization further, so we can see that the DNA which is uh, formed uh, present in the cell, it gives, it transcribes to form the RNA. From the RNA, it uh, translates to form the various proteins and the proteins, many of the proteins forms the metabolites or biochemicals which many a times acts as the messengers or the secondary messengers also. So, these are the various levels of organization. Now, the study of the genes are basically called as the genomics, while the study of the RNA is called as the transcriptomics, the study of the proteins are called as the proteomics and the study of the metabolites are called as the metabolomics. So, these are the various omics which have come into the picture nowadays. So, uh, the researchers are trying to decipher out the complete transcriptomics, proteomics and the metabolics of the human body with all the organelles into the picture. So, that is the next level of the research in which the research is going on. Now, the glycolysis process which is regarded as one of the basic process and the first discovered metabolic processes is basically divided into a 10 step process. So, it is divided into the preparatory phase and the second phase is called as the payoff phase. So, in the first phase the glucose splits into two molecules of C3 carbon which is called as the glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate and in the payoff phase what happens is two molecules of glycerol dehyde 3 phosphate by five subsequent steps goes into the formation of pyruvate which is a three carbon molecule and in the process there is synthesis of NADH and production of ATP molecule. So, the net gain of the ATP molecule in the case of the glycolysis is two ATP molecules. Now, if we see the different types of the um, microscopic 
organization so the cells have been quantified into the various cellular structures and cellular levels so uh, uh, with this particular thing i come to the end of my lecture so in this lecture we discuss what exactly the cells are what are the contribution of the various scientists who helped in the de uh, discovery and characterizing these cells and subsequently we came into how exactly the cells are functioning into various specialized forms so thank you very much thank you with this note thank you sir thank you so much for giving us this uh, session friends you are requested to be with us as we are going to be back after a short break and we are going to discuss more till then be with us thank you Hello friends welcome back to the session trends as you know that today we are talking on cell the basic unit of life this is the topic of a discussion and for the discussion we have with us in our studios dr amit bhattacharya dr amit bhattacharya is assistant professor in department of uh, zoology ramdas college university of delhi dr bhattacharya is a prolific professor he always uh, enlightened you with the knowledge and he believes that uh, the more and more uh, a uh, knowledge to be shared to the students uh, so friends uh, if you wish to ask questions from dr amit bhattacharya feel free to talk to us to our toll free number our number is 18001010430 and repeat our number is 18001010430 now i would like to welcome our guest dr amit bhattacharya once again hello sir thank welcome you back. thank you so in this part of the lecture i will be talking about how exactly the cell functions and how exactly they develop and replicates and multiplies and then we will discuss about the various important cell organelles which are present in the cell so if we see this picture this picture is showing the various important organelles within the cells like the lysosomes plasma membrane golgi complex then the nucleus endoplasmic reticulum mitochondria nucleolus chromatin and the rough endoplasmic reticulum so this is a electron micrograph picture of a animal cells which are showing the various structural entities now this is a light micrograph of the various representatives of the plant cells so we can see the first one which are basically the parenchymal cells which are responsible for the photosynthesis and other uh, metabolic reactions then the second b picture is showing the colenchyma cells which are specialized for support and thickened 
uh, and have thickened cell walls which can be we can easily make out from the difference between A and B. The C1 are basically the epidermal cells on the surface of the leaf. So, we can see the stomata which are pre present in these epidermal cells and the D1s are the vessel elements and the tracheids uh, which are basically the elongated cells that are arranged end to end to form the vessels of the xylem. So, we can see the specific and representative representation of the various plant cells. Now, if we see the representation of the animal uh, cells, we can see some of the epithelial cells of the mouth. So, we can see the thick multilayered sheet which is present over here. Then the uh, various B, B cells are basically the fibroblast or the connective tissue cells which are pre present over here which are characterized by the elongated spindle shape. So, by these ones we can differentiate how exactly these cells which are present in the various parts of the body, how they are specialized to do certain specialized functions and how exactly they differentiates into one another. Now, before going into the specialization of the cells and detailings of the cells, we should know about the three domain systems which is basically the phylogenetic tree of life. So, the three domain systems which was given up basically uh, segregated into bacterial system, archaea system and the eukaryotic system. Now, the three domain system was developed by the Calvose and it is a system to classify the biological organisms. So, from the late 1960s, the organisms have been classified according to the five kingdom systems, which is basically a classification system developed by a Swedish scientist Linus and it is commonly based on the physical characteristics. So, under this six uh, this uh, three domain and six kingdoms, the domains are the archaea, bacteria, then the uh, eukaryotic cell which is there, then the kingdoms are basically archaea bacteria which are basically the ancient bacteria, U bacteria which are true bacteria, protista, fungi, plantae and the animal kingdoms. So, these are the various kingdoms which are present under them. Now, this picture also represents the bacteria, archae and the eukaryotic systems over here. So, we can see the eukaryotic system has got animals uh, classes which are there which includes the roundworms, insect, fish, mammals, birds, reptiles, then the fungi which are basically the yeast cells, then the molds and the plants contains the monocots, dicots, then the various protozoans like the giardia, malaria parasite, red algae which are there. Then the archaea system is there and subsequently the bacterial system is also present. Now, if we see the representation, how exactly the sizes of these particular molecules comes up. So, the uh, in the human visions, the one of the largest size is the frog eggs, which, which has got a diameter of about 2.5 millimeter, then the paramecium, which is about 1.5 millimeter long. Then comes the epithelial cells which are about 30 micrometer in height which is there. Then the uh, chloroplast 8 micrometer diameter lymphocytes which are 12 micrometer. So, we can see how exactly the size of the molecules is coming down as the specialized functioning and the uh, molecular processes is going into the picture. Now, the cells basically follow uh, the development process and the uh, replication by a system which is called as the cell cycle. So, all these cells are being characterized by a cell cycle because we know that all these cells after a certain period of time of growth and development, they automatically dies off. So, this process of dying is called as the apoptosis or the programmed cell death. Now, how exactly these cells are programmed and how exactly the development and the growth processes takes place. So, the cell cycle basically contains two major uh, portions. One is called as the mitotic phase, the other one is called as the interphase. So, the my, uh, interphase carries the three phases which is called as the G1, S and the G2 phase, while the mitotic phase contains the various uh, mitosis phases such as the prophase, metaphase, anaphase and the telophases. Now, the interphase can be divided into the subphases which we just discussed which are called as the G1 phase, S phase, G2 and the mitotic phase is made up of mitosis and the cytokinesis. 
Now, the mitosis generally is present, uh, begins after G1 phase and ends before the G1 phase of the next particular cell cycle. So, we know the time span of each of these phases. Now, we come into the better representation how exactly these particular phases looks like. So, in the mitosis, the first phase which comes up is called as the prophase, uh, which is basically pre in which the cells get ready for the subsequent mitotic division. Then comes the prometaphase in which the uh, non kinetochore microtubules are formed and the chromosomes which have got condensed from the chromatin materials start getting aligned in the uh, equatorial plane or the center of the cell. Now, subsequently in the case of the metaphases, all the chromosomes get aligned or stationed at the equatorial plane. So, we can see the, uh, the uh, fluorescent microscopic image of this metaphase in which the chromosomes are represented blue in color. So, the uh, uh, sister chromatids are represented blue in color while the spindle fibers are shown in green in color. So, where and the next one which comes up is called as the anaphases. So, in the anaphases each of the sister chromatids get uh, dislodged from each other at the point of attachment which is called as the centromere and they start moving towards the opposite pole. So, in the, we can see in the anaphase how exactly the chromatin structure looks like. They generally takes a shape of V shape. Then the next one which comes up is called as the telophases in which the, uh, the cell division start taking place. So, each of the daughter cell has got a diploid set of chromosomes. So, each of them is having now a chromosome number which we represent as N. Now, if we see the structure over here, the uh, diagram over here, we can see the metaphase is being represented. So, we can see easily make out how exactly the chromosomes are aligned in the equatorial plane. Then we see some of the uh, anaphases over here. So, we can see each of the chromatidon which has got separated from one another at the point of attachment which is the centromere and how exactly they have moved apart. Now, the mitosis in the plant cell is represented over here. So, the first one is called as the prophase where the chromatin is condensing and the cell is getting prepared for the subsequent mitosis. Then comes the prometaphase. So, we can see the discrete uh, chromosomes and each consists of two identical sister chromatids. Then comes the metaphase in which the chromosomes get aligned in the equatorial plane and the spindle fibers comes up uh, uh, from the centrioles and they get attached to the uh, chromosomes at a point which is called as the kinetochore present in the centromere. Now, in the anaphase, each of the chromatid arm gets separated from each other and they start moving towards the opposite pole. So, the daughter chromosomes are moving to the ends of the cell as their kinetochore or the microtubule shortens. And the final, the fifth stage is called as the telophase in which the daughter nucleus are formed and the cytokinesis takes place, which means the di division of the cytoplasm takes place. The cell plate is formed in the case of the plant cells. So, we can see the cell plate which has been formed over here and this is present in the cytoplasm. So, cytoplasm gets divided into two portions and each of the daughter cell gets a haploid number of chromosome. Now, we come into the next particular uh, important uh, mode of uh, uh, reproduction which is called as the meiosis or many a times referred as the sexual reproduction. So, a, it is a division of the nucleus that reduces the chromosome number and the meiosis is basically divided into two phases. One is called as meiosis 1, the other one is called as the meiosis 2. So, meiosis is pretty important in the sexual reproduction and it is also important in passing on the genetic information or forming genetically distinct or new species over there. Now, before going into the meiosis, we should know some of the common terms which are there. One is called as the diploid, which means two sets of the chromosomes. So, humans have got 23 pairs, which means the total number of chromosomes is 46. 
while the next term which comes into the picture is the haploid which means one set of the chromosome or n so gamete or the sex cells are having a haploid set of chromosomes which are formed from the process of meiosis then comes the synapses which is the pairing of the homologous chromosome to form a tetrad and the th fourth one is called as the crossing over which means that chromatids of the tetrad exchange their parts over there now the various stages of the meiosis as i told you have been broadly classified into meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 so if we see in the interface the cell gets prepared for the meiosis so uh, there is a homologous pair of replicating chromosomes which are present so one is shown in blue in color the other one is shown in red in color so in the meiosis 1 which is called as the reductional division in which what happens is each each of the daughter cell gets a homologous chromosomes into them so one blue homologous chromosome gets into one cell while the red one goes into the other cell and subsequently when it goes into the meiosis 2 which is called as the equational division each of the chromatid arm from this particular blue chromosome which is the homologous pair of chromosomes get separated while two uh, daughter cells formed are formed from the red which are formed from the uh, homologous chromosome so we can see there is a reduction in the number so from 2n the four daughter cells which are formed at the end of the meiosis 2 each of them are having n copy number now if we go into the details of this meiosis so we will understand it better so now in the interphase which is basically the starting phase subsequently comes the prophase 1 then comes the prophase 2 so we can see the homologous chromosomes or the pairs they exchange the segment in the prophase 1 which is subdivided into subphases like uh, uh, leptotin, zygotin, paketin, diplotin, dikinesis. So, in the paketin stage, there is a crossing over which takes place in the presence uh, at a point which is called as the chiasmata, where the segmental uh, uh, overlapping takes place. So, this is the point which is called as the crossing over. Subsequently, when it comes into the metaphase, each of the homologous chromosomes start getting aligned at the equatorial plane and the uh, microtubule spindle fibers get formed and they get attached at the point of attachment which is the centromere and in the case of the anaphase 1 each of these homologous chromosomes which were uh, in uh, pairs are present at the equatorial plane get separated and they start moving towards the opposite pole now then comes the telophase 1 and the cytokinesis in which each of the daughter cells are having n copy number then subsequently the meiosis 2 takes place which separates the sister chromatid so it also has got prophase 2 then comes the pro metaphase 2 in which the homo uh, the chromosomes get attached in the equatorial plane and then comes the anaphase 1 in which each of the sister chromatid gets separated and they start moving towards the opposite pole and then comes the telophase 2 and the cytokinesis so during another round of the cell division the sister chromatid finally gets separated and four haploid uh, daughter cells are formed containing single chromosome copy number so we can see from 2n copy number how exactly the n copy numbers have been formed now we come into the discussion about the various organelles which are present in the basic unit of life which are the cells so this diagrammatic representation is showing a cross section of the various major organelles which which are present in the animal cells such as the nucleus which contains the nuclear envelope then it contains the chromatin nucleolus nuclear pore the, all these forms the nucleus then comes the ribosomes then the endoplasmic reticulum to this endoplasmic reticulum there is addition of the ribosomes and it forms or give rise to the rough endoplasmic reticulum then the golgi complexes then the mitochondria centrioles vacuole lysosome so all these structure cellular organelles forms or combines in a synchronized way to form the basic unit of life now we come into the first one which is called as the plasma membrane so we know that the plasma membrane is basically made up of lipid bilayer so 
there are two layers of lipid phospholipids which are present so these phospholipids are having a hydrophilic head which means that they are water loving while they have got a hydrophobic tail which is present so there are two layers of these phospholipids which are present apart from these phospholipids there is presence of peripheral proteins and the integral proteins so we can see many of the integral proteins which are represented over here like the protein channels which are the transport proteins then comes the globular proteins which are present then the alpha helix protein or the uh, integral proteins which are present then there are lots of peripheral proteins which are also present over there uh, which are represented over there so we can see this cellular structure uh, which is present on the top of the cell which is called as the plasma membrane so this model was basically devised by singer and nicholson in the year 1972 and they described the cell membrane as a two dimensional lipid liquid structure that restricts the lateral diffusion of membrane components so this cell membrane plays a very important role in maintaining the integrity of the cell now inside this uh, cell membrane there is a presence of a major uh, cellular um, uh, organelles which is called as the nucleus and apart from the nucleus there is a presence of nucleolus also so the nucleus contains the nuclear envelope it contains the chromatin which gets subsequently condensed to form the chromosomes and it contains the nucleolus so nucleolus are basically the sites where the rna synthesis takes place and these rna forms the basic uh, molecule uh, building blocks for the ribosomal formation ribosome formation also so these nucleus and the nucleolus plays a very important role in the euk eukaryotic cells now if we see the dna contents in the various uh, organisms especially the bacteria unicellular eukaryotes plants animals so we can see the haploid number of dna contents which is varying from each of them so in the bacteria if you see in the mycoplasm there are about 0.6 millions uh, millions of base pairs which are present in the e coli there are 4.6 million base pairs which are present then if we come into the unicellular eukaryotes like the euglena there are about 3000 million base pairs which are present in the plant like the arabidopsis and the zymes there are about 125 and 5000 million base pairs which are present respectively while in the animal kingdom if we see the mouse and the human model systems there are about 300 million base pairs which are present which corresponds to about 20 to 25000 genes which uh, actively participates in the various metabolic processes now the basic uh, genetic material present within this nucleus is the dna so all of us know about the dna which is basically made up of double helix structure and there are uh, uh, there are bond pairing which is there between the adenine and thymine so there is a adenine thymine uh, bond pairing which is there then there is a gl uh, glycine and cytosine bond pairing which is there so the dna forms the basic structure over here so dna is a double helix structure with the bases on the inside and the sugar phosphate backbones on the outside of the molecule so the bases on the opposite strand are paired by hydrogen bond between the adenine and the thymine which is represented over here so we can see the adenine and thymine which is bond with each other with the help of two hydrogen bonds while the guanine and the cytosines are bonded with each other with the help of three hydrogen bonds the two dna strands run opposite in the opposite direction to each other from 5 dash to 3 dash direction now the next major organelles which are present in the uh, cells is called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum so the rough endoplasmic reticulum is basically the site for the protein synthesis we uh, that's why they are called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum because on this endoplasmic reticulum there is a presence of ribosomes which are present on the top of it so the from the dna the rna is formed in the nucleus subsequently the rna is transported into the cytoplasm and once it is transported to the cytoplasm it gets attached to the ribosomes which are attached on the endoplasmic reticulum for the translation process the rna is then translated to form the protein molecule which are then sorted within the endoplasmic reticulum we'll see what exactly happens then 
the next major organelles comes is called as the golgi complexes so it checks modifies and packages the various proteins so it has got the uh, various phases so there is a cis phase there is a trans phase in the golgi complex also now this diagrammatic representation represents how exactly the protein is formed and the sorting of the protein takes place so we can see the ribosomes which are attached on the endoplasmic reticulum they produce the proteins which is then transported inside the endoplasmic reticulum then subsequently they are blebbed out with the help of the bubbles over there these uh, these vesicles then transition vesicles then move into the endoplasmic reticulum they get fused into the uh, golgi complexes and by uh, adding to the golgi complexes it transfers the protein over there then the protein sorting takes place in the various uh, cristae of the golgi complexes and accordingly the secretory vesicles are formed so these particular proteins are secreted outside by the exocytosis and there are certain uh, uh, there are other transporter molecules which are also formed such as the lysosomes which are also formed the various enzymes are formed various membrane receptors are sorted out which needs to be put on the top of the membranes over there so that's how the protein sorting takes place with the help of the endoplasmic reticulum and the golgi complexes the next major important molecules which are present in these uh, cells the animals and the plant cells is basically the mitochondria and the chloroplast so the mitochondria is present while in the plant cells there is a pre presence of a chloroplast the which is there so the chloroplast is the one which is responsible for the photosynthesis processes now the chloroplast has got the thylakoids which are there which are uh, uh, stoma uh, attached then there are inner bilayer uh, membrane which is present then there is outer bilayer membrane which are present now in the case of the mitochondria there are cristae which are present so there is a outer mitochondrial membrane then there is a intermembrane space there comes the inner mitochondrial membrane which is uh, fo formed into a loop like structure or the cristae which are formed so many of the aerobic processes takes place within the mitochondrial matrix also now in the mitochondria uh, uh, and the chloroplast formation or the evolution there is a theory which has come up uh, in the year 1910 uh, by the uh, first articulated in 1905 and 1910 by the russian botanist mason college and advanced and substantiated by the microbial evidence by lyn margulis in the year 1967 so this particular theory was called as the endosymbiotic theory or symbiogenesis so this particular theory gives us a representation how evolutionary by the evolution the mitochondria and the chloroplast are being formed so it is said that initially there is a proto eukaryote cells which are present subsequently there are infoldings in the plasma membrane of the ancestral pro prokaryote which gave rise to the endomembrane components including the nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum then in the first endosymbiote event the ancestral eukaryote consumed a aerobic bacteria that evolved into the mitochondria so that's how the first mitochondrial genome came into the picture then in a second endosymbiotic event the early eukaryote consumed photosynthetic bacteria that evolved into the chloroplast so in the second endosymbiotic event a photosynthetic bacteria was consumed which contained the chloroplast and that's how the chloroplast came into the picture so number 3 represents the second endosymbiotic event and then subsequently the photosynthetic bacterium came in and which formed the uh, the chloroplast and the bacterium which formed the uh, mitochondria and the cells so we can see the modern uh, photosynthetic eukaryote which contains the mitochondria and the chloroplast while the modern heterotrophic eukaryote which contains the my mitochondria so this was one of the instrumental theory which came into the picture giving us the clue how exactly the mitochondria chloroplast and the cell evolved from the prokaryotic system so with this note i come to the end of the lecture where we discussed about the functioning and how exactly this cell reproduce and 
divides by the process of mitosis and meiosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for giving us this productive session on cell, the basic unit of life. Dear friends, we know that you might have questions in mind. If you were not able to ask questions live, you have privilege to ask your questions through email. You can contact us through our email ID that is info.cec at nic.in. This is the ID through which you can post your questions to us and we will try to give answers to your questions when Dr. Arud Bhattacharya visits us next time as well as if you wish to give your feedback for this pertaining lecture, you are most welcome. Friends, we are going to upload this lecture on YouTube soon and uh, after watching the lecture, if you feel so, to ask questions, yes, of course, we always say we are there for you. We are taking your leave today with the promise that we are going to meet again soon and we would be discussing on another topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you once again. Thank you.